So in this session, you will learn basic alignment and actions for a few of the most commonly practiced postures. In nearly every single case, each posture is aligned, beginning at the feet and the ankles, moving to the knees and legs, the pelvic girdle, the torso, the shoulder girdle, the arms and hands, and then ending with the neck and head. So of course, this order would be reversed if you're doing something that's upside down, like an inversion, but we will not really be getting into much of those today other than downward facing dog. It's extremely helpful to think about building postures from the ground up. Making sure your foundation is completely aligned and solid before moving on to any other areas of the body. So it's also helpful to look at each posture in terms of three major platforms of the body. So the first platform being the foot and the ankle, the second being the pelvic girdle, and the third being the shoulder girdle. With this in mind, we're gonna move through a few of the basic yoga postures and some of the alignment cues that you will want to know in order to get started with your own personal practice as well as teaching others. So the first pose we'll discuss is Tadasana, or Mountain Pose. This is the foundational pose for all other poses. So once you get a really firm grasp on this posture, you'll be able to apply its characteristics to almost every other posture. So let's go ahead and practice it. If you're sitting, stand up with me. You're gonna stand with your feet parallel and a hips distance apart. So we can think about the platform, so we discussed earlier, right? We want that platform, the ankles right in line, stacked over the heels. And then we're gonna move up from there and make sure that the hips are stacked over the ankles. And then from there, that the shoulders are stacked over the hips. So once all of our platforms are in line, we can have the palms facing forward, we can relax the shoulders down the back. Now, this is a really quick run through of the alignment for Tadasana. We can get a little bit more detailed. So again, starting from your feet, you could try to apply pressure equally into all four corners of the feet. Now simultaneously as you're doing that, see if you could lift both the inner arch and the outer arch of your foot up. So this will activate and engage the muscles of the legs and move energy from the floor up through the body. Now once you've found that, once the leg muscles are engaged, you could find the tiniest of tilt from the pelvis up towards the belly button. Now you don't want to tuck. You don't want to tuck the hips underneath. You actually want to lengthen your tailbone, keeping a natural curve in your lower back and just finding a tiny little bit of engagement in the low belly. From here, make sure that the ribs are stacked over the hips as well. And then again, the crown of the head is in line with the shoulders, is in line with the hips, is in line with the heels. My shoulders are not slouched or rolling forward at all. They're slightly rolling back and open and I'm broad here in the front of the chest where my collarbones are. So you can get really, really detailed or you can keep it pretty general. Align your platforms and then go or move through all these other little intricacies of the posture. So let's try to go through another posture. Now this next posture is actually a movement and it's cat-cow. So this is one you're gonna do a lot in a yoga class. Now for this, we're gonna come down onto the hands and knees in a tabletop position. So I'm gonna make sure that my shoulders are stacked over my wrists and that my hips are stacked over my knees. So those are two really important alignment cues for this position. Now my hands are slightly turned out, just the tiniest little bit, like a half an inch. And this helps with that external rotation of the upper arm and the shoulder. Now we'll start with a cow position. So the belly, although it's kind of going to relax down towards the ground, I'm not sticking my stomach out. I'm keeping my belly slightly engaged and I'm drawing my chest forward and through the upper arms. So in cow position, you are keeping that engagement of the low belly to support the low back. Notice my shoulders don't shift back or shift forward at all. They stay stacked right on top of the wrists. So this is the cow position, broadening the chest external rotation in the shoulders, and the stacking of the hip and the shoulders over the ankle and the knee. Now for cat position, we do the opposite with the spine. So we'll push into the palms of the hands, scoop out the belly, and try to round into the upper back space. So this is a really nice stretch between the shoulder blades on the upper back. Now you're suctioning your belly button in and up towards the spine. And again, my shoulders stay stacked over the wrist. They're not moving back or forward at all in this position. So stacking is really crucial when we're working on our alignment. When your joints are stacked, you're more stable. When they're not stacked, you're less stable. This is a really good rule of thumb. So from cat-cow, we're gonna take this into downward facing dog, which is a really 
popular posture in practice. It's also technically considered an inversion, which means your hips are above your heart. From downward facing dog, it's the same alignment here with the hands. We're gonna turn the palms out just the tiniest bit to help with that external rotation of the shoulders. I'll tuck the toes and then begin to lift the knees off the mat and push my hips back. Now, if I live in a tighter body, I'm gonna keep this bend in the knees and try to lengthen the sides of my waist and my spine without sticking out my belly and my butt. So I'm still maintaining strength in the middle of the body. Now, if I live in a little bit more of a bendy body, I can start to work the legs towards straight, reaching the heels down towards the mat beneath me. Again, keep pushing the hips back so you take some of the weight out of the arms and move it into the legs. So we would try to build this posture from the ground up, making sure that your feet are in line with your ankles, the feet are parallel, not turned out, not turned in. Once I found that, I can find a gentle inward rotation of my thighs, like the energy is moving back behind me. That helps to open my pelvic floor area and to move my hips back a little bit further. Now, you might feel a stretch in your hamstrings or your lower back as you do this, and that's absolutely okay. And then we can build from the ground up with our hands as well. So the hands turn out a little bit, external rotation in the shoulders, the neck and the head are in line, and then I draw my ribs in, my belly in, and I push the hips back. Downward facing dog. So the next position we'll get into is plank. Now plank is really similar to tabletop, and in fact, you could use tabletop instead of plank if you don't have the strength yet to hold your plank position. If you do have the full strength to work on plank, then we keep this upper body alignment, the turnout of the hands, the rotation externally of the shoulders, and we step one leg followed by the other leg back into plank. Again, I'm making sure my joints are stacked. My feet are parallel. My belly is drawing in and up without sticking the butt out or swaying the low back at all. So everything merges to the midline of the body. Plank is pretty straightforward here, but it's done wrong oftentimes. Oftentimes I see people with their hands way far out in front of them, or maybe if you're dropping your knees down, the hands can be too far forward. I also see people in front like this so that the wrists are in this really stressed state which doesn't feel great on the hands. So make sure you're really stacked and supporting your body in this position, that you're not collapsing in the shoulders or the head and the neck. Everything is in line. Now the next movement that we're gonna get into is chaturanga, and this is a really difficult movement and pose. So I have two blocks here. If you don't have two blocks at home, you could use books, you could even use a dense, stiff pillow, or a rolled up blanket, anything to support you as we move through this position. This is a very beginner version of Chaturanga, but it's going to be very helpful as you start to progress your practice. So I take these two blocks and I'm gonna put them down so that they're about shoulders distance on my mat. And my hands are gonna come behind the blocks about a foot and I'm gonna find my way into my plank position from here. So plank can be with the knees down, Plank can be with the legs up, whichever you prefer. I'm gonna shift the weight forward here so that when I bend my elbows, my shoulders could come down and rest on the block. And this creates this 90 degree angle with the elbow and the shoulder here. It doesn't allow my shoulders to go below my neck and my chest. And that's really crucial so you're supporting your shoulder girdle. Now you could suck your belly up so much that your hands could lift, woo, and I'm shaking. Ugh, and then put your hands back down. So you can do the same thing with your knees down here. They don't have to be lifted. This is chaturanga, and then from this position, you could push straight back up into your plank, okay? That's only if you have the strength to do so. Again, this is a very advanced version. You saw me shaking, and I've been practicing for 10 years. Mind you, I'm a little weak, but. <laughs> so, chaturanga. That alignment with the shoulder and the elbow is crucial, that 90 degree angle. When your shoulder goes past that point, it puts stress on the shoulder, shoulder girdle and you can really injure yourself. So if anything, I would actually recommend not going down as far if you're weak. Dropping the knees if you're a little bit weaker and building your strength. If you go down less, you'll begin to build strength faster than if you go down more than that 90 degree angle. This is not doing you any good. Okay, so really pay attention to that in your practice. So the next poses that we'll be doing, two of them, cobra 
and upward facing dog. These are back bends. These are opening of the chest and the shoulders. So Cobra Pose is a gentler back bend and upward facing dog is a little bit more intense of a back bend. Cobra starts on the belly. The hands will be kind of in line with the chest. Okay? And the elbows, instead of sticking out like this, are going to be hugging into the midline of the body. And then that external rotation of the shoulders happens. Now, in this position, we're still using the energy of the legs. So we push the tops of the feet down to activate the legs. Your pinky toe is pushing down just as much as your big toe is pushing down. From here, see if you could draw your belly in and up to support your low back. And then, on your in-breath, you just rise up a couple of inches into your cobra. And as you exhale, you can come right back down. So you can do this a few times. Inhale, you lift up. Exhale, you lower down. Try one more. Inhale, come up. And let's stay right here on the exhale. So a really nice way to test and see if you're using your legs enough is to see if you could just hover your hands off the mat here. And if it's difficult for you to lift your hands, that tells me that you're not engaging your lower body. So we need the lower body to support us in this position. Lower body first, upper body follows, and then relax. So for upward facing dog, it's, and again, a back bend, but this is a little bit more intense than cobra. So the hands are gonna slide back maybe another inch or two from where they were in the cobra position. From here, I activate my legs, pushing down into the tops of the feet. I scoop out my belly. I'm gonna slowly on the inhale, lift the chest up, external rotation in the shoulders. As I exhale, I push into the palms, straightening the arms and lifting the knees and thighs off the mat. So I'm not just hanging out here, right? My shoulders scrunched up by my ears, my knees and thighs just resting on the mat. This puts a ton of pressure in my low back. It does not feel good. So I push down into the feet, I scoop my belly in and up, roll the shoulders open, and find that opening in the front chest. So again, look at the alignment. My shoulders are stacked over my wrists. Belly is supporting low back. This is upward facing dog. I'm gonna take a little child's pose in between these back bends for release. You can do the same at home, just hips to heels here. So after this, we're gonna be moving into some standing postures. Now, these main standing postures are crescent lunge, warrior one, warrior two, warrior three, Ardha Chandrasana, and tree pose. These are really solid foundational practices that you will learn as you go forward through yoga. So really, really good to learn them here. The first pose that we'll be doing is crescent lunge. Now this has a neutral rotation for your hips, crescent lunge, which means that both of your legs are in this plane going from front to back, right? Which if you can remember, this was the sagittal plane of movement. So this is where our crescent lunge lives. <clears throat> so in order to find crescent lunge, one foot is forward, one leg is back, the back leg is straight, the front knee is bent. My hips are neutrally rotated. So let's build this from the ground up. I make sure the front foot has even pressure between all four corners of the foot. I make sure my back foot, I'm pushing through the ball or the big toe mound of that foot. And then on the front foot, I suck the inner and outer arches up so that my leg really engages. I stack my knee over my ankle. This ensures the stability of the ankle and the knee, both. Then I move my energy from my pelvic floor up with a little lift in the belly. Again, hips are neutral. Low back is long and spacious. Front ribs are not sticking out here. They're actually drawing in as the entire rib cage lifts up. And then to complete the pose, I would reach my arms straight up. Now my shoulders are not scrunching by my ears. They're relaxed. My outer arms are engaged and firming in. And then you can hold this pose for a few breaths here, feeling a lift from the crown of the head, that very center midline of your body. Now, to come into warrior one, which is our next pose, it's almost identical to crescent lunge, except for the back foot is turned down, so the outer edge of the foot is now pushing into the mat. My hips are still working towards neutral. And in this position, it's really good to note that my feet are not on the same line. So I don't have my right foot and my left foot like this. I have a little bit of space to give my hips some space for the position. So once I get into the pose, again, I check out my feet. I build from the ground up. 
I activate the four corners, I suck up through the inner and outer arches, I neutralize my hips, I lengthen my low back and strengthen my low belly, stack my shoulders over my hips, and then reach my arms up and lengthen through the crown of the head. So you'll see a lot of these alignment things are very, very similar from pose to pose. Now we'll be moving from warrior one to warrior three because these are related. They both have a neutral rotation of the hips. So in warrior three, I would lean forward and just lift off of the back leg. So I'm creating a T shape with my body here. Now everything is aligned and stacked over the standing leg. So I want the knee over the ankle, the hip over the knee, and then the upper body that's lifted is in line with the back leg that's lifted. So imagining that if I was standing on that left leg, I would still find that standard anatomical position, that alignment, the stacking of the joints in the shoulder girdle and hip girdle. And then I would come down and rest. Now moving into warrior two. So warrior two is similar to warrior one except the hips are now externally rotated. So my front knee is bent, my back leg is straight, and then arms would reach out to the sides. Right? So you can imagine, it's the same stuff that we've been talking about. You're rooting down through your feet, you're pulling energy up through the legs, you're finding the alignment here in the waist, the torso, and up through the crown of the head. This one has a little special nuance though. So my back foot, I actually want to turn the back foot in on a little bit of a diagonal. My hips will then turn on that same diagonal that the back toes are pointed. Now this is to support my spine and to reduce any sort of instance of sciatica or pinched nerves in the lower back. So if I crank my hip open and I have my foot turned open, this jams up my low back on the right side. I want to open up my low back on the right side. So I'm going to suck the right thigh bone back, wrap the outer left hip forward, and then engage right here. Little lift. Okay? So this happens a lot in Warrior Two. I see people doing this one all the time, so really be careful that you've got the proper alignment here. Start with your feet. Back toes angled in, front toes angled forward, and then move up your legs. Find that rotation of the hip, the engagement of the belly, and then you can take your torso and work your torso towards square, not the hips. This engages your oblique muscles and forces you to really support your spine by activating your core. And then from here, arms are extended out wide to your sides. Energy is lifting through the crown of your head. This is a really active pose. Now we'll come into Ardha Chandrasana and Triangle, which are both related to Warrior Two. Ardha Chandrasana is a balancing pose similar to Warrior Three. This one is the same rotation as Warrior Two. So my top leg is actually neutrally rotated. My bottom leg is externally rotated. Now if this one's really challenging for you, you could grab a block. Put your hand directly on the block and make sure that is underneath your shoulder for proper alignment. Okay? The top hand can rest on your hip or you could reach it straight up to the ceiling. So I like to keep a little bend in the standing knee to make sure I'm not locking out that knee. And then make sure that you're putting even pressure in all four corners of the foot, that your knee is tracking over your second toe on that standing leg. Top leg is not swinging back behind you. That tells me that you're dumping in your lower back and you're not activating your core. So core activation will pull the top leg in line with the hip. And if you feel stable, you could reach your top arm straight up to the ceiling. Now we'll take this position and move into Uttita Trikonasana or triangle pose. So it's the same foot alignment as warrior two, but now this front leg is working to straight. My hips are still in this rotation, so they're pointing the same direction as the back toes. My torso is still working on squaring and opening to the side of the room. So I can lower the block. I can put my hand on the shin. I could even bring my hand down to the floor. You're gonna work with whatever feels best in your body. Now this bottom shoulder in triangle tends to kind of wrap in a little bit. So we're gonna need to find external rotation to stack the shoulder directly over the wrist. So always check and make sure that you're stacking. Once you've found the position, the tendency is to shift the gaze up towards the, uh, the ceiling, or you could also look down towards your hand if you feel more stable. Now one little extra nuance of this pose is that you don't want to hyperextend your front knee. So it's really helpful for me to think about 
sliding a little imaginary sheet of paper under the heel of the front foot. And you don't even have to lift the foot off the mat. You could just have the tiniest little energetic lift here. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna take the hyperextension out of the leg and really activate the muscles that you need to activate in order to support you in this position. Okay, so those are all of the standing poses except for our tree pose. And this is another balancing pose. So for tree pose, you can do this on each of the legs. I'm gonna do it on my left leg. So I would take the left foot and either bring it to the calf or to the upper inner thigh. So you just wanna avoid putting pressure on your knee. This is really important. So I'll have the foot on my calf for our purposes today. So in this position, this leg is really strong and straight. Again, I don't have to lock it out. I can keep a little bend. Obviously this leg and this knee and this hip is an external rotation here, right? You can see external, neutral in the body. Now, if you're unstable, just bring your hands to your hips, work on stacking, shoulders over hips, hips over feet. If you're stable and you wanna to try to add a little bit, you could reach your arms up like a real tree with branches, okay? Make sure here that you're not sticking out your ribs or your belly in any way, you're really engaged and active. And you're lifting from the inner and outer arch of the foot all the way up and out through the crown of the head. So the next pose we're gonna be doing is bridge pose. And this is actually down on your mat. This is a back bend. So it's a little bit different than the standing postures we've been doing. A lot different, actually. So I'm gonna to come to lie down here on my back. And once I lie down, <clears throat> you wanna make sure that your heels are directly underneath your knees. So not way out here in front and not right up by your butt so close that your knees are actually in front of your ankles. So you want them stacked again, right? Heels and knees, okay? And then arms will be down by your sides here. Now you can still find external rotation of the shoulders in this position, so you're not clamming up like this. So push your shoulders down, broaden the collarbones, and puff up your chest a little bit here in this position. Now, even though the chest is puffed up, that doesn't mean you stick your belly and your ribs out. Belly and ribs stay in and engaged. So now I get to push down into the feet to slowly lift the hips up. Now when I'm lifting my hips, I'm not clenching my buttocks really tightly because if I clench my butt tight, my knees are gonna pop out. So this is gonna take my knees away from that stacking alignment over my, my ankles here. So I relax the glutes a little bit. I engage the muscles of the hamstrings and the quads, the top of the thighs. And then with my glutes soft, this alignment happens. The parallel alignment of my thighs and my shins and the stacking of the knees over the ankles. So now I'm supported in my lower body. So my upper body, I can start to kind of lengthen my tailbone towards the backs of the knees. Remember, it's not a tucking. I'm not clenching the butt cheeks, but I'm lengthening, drawing my pubic bone to the belly button just to engage that low belly a little bit. And once I found that, I work into the upper chest, pushing the palms down. I can externally rotate the shoulders a little bit more. I can lift the chest up a little bit more and find this really nice opening in the front body. Now in this position, it's really important to move your chin away from the chest a little bit. So the back of the neck is long and I can still move energy from the crown of my head out in this direction. Okay, so the elements, the principles of that original Tadasana, that original mountain pose still apply here. So to come out of this, I would just gently lower down and rest knocking my knees together as a little breather. The next position we're gonna do is a seated hip stretch, and this is really a simple version of a hip stretch. There are much deeper hip stretches that you can do. It depends on your body, but today, for our purposes, we're gonna keep it really simple. So I take Sukhasana, which is basically crisscross applesauce. We call this easy pose in yoga. And I'm gonna make sure that I'm crossing at the mid-shin area, or the mid-calf area. And then I'm gonna go ahead and flex my feet so my ankles are supported and they're not collapsed or um, sickling my feet at all. And once you've found that, you might already be feeling an opening in your hips. You might need to sit up on a block and put your hips elevated on this block. Now, you'll know if you need to do that because you'll be sitting in this like really hunched over position and it's gonna be hard to sit up straight. So when you sit on a block, you can rotate your pelvis to lengthen the sides of your waist, to lengthen your front and your back body. Now, if you do use the block, that's great. You're just gonna sit and stay as you are. If you don't use the block, you could take your hands out in front of you and just really slowly start to crawl your fingertips forward. 
Now, with every inch that I crawl the fingertips forward, I push my hips and my sit bones back into the mat behind me. So I can kind of treat this as a little experiment. I'm gonna crawl forward, see what feels good, push the hips back and down. If I have a little more, I can keep going. I could also use the block here to rest my forehead on, right, if that's available for you. If you live in a bendy body, your head might just come down to the floor. That's okay too. Now make sure when doing this stretch that you get both sides. So you're gonna to wanna to uncross the legs, recross them, and then work into the second side of the stretch. Okay. Now for a hip stretch like this, I recommend staying in it for about two to three minutes on each side. You can always do more than that, but that's sort of the bare minimum. Now the last pose I'm gonna walk you through is Shavasana. This is an important one because you'll most likely be doing it in every yoga class as well. This is one of my favorite poses. And it's one of the most advanced yoga poses. <laughs> so Shavasana is basically Tadasana, lying down on your back. But you're not keeping this parallel rotation, this neutral rotation of the leg. You're letting everything relax. So your feet should kind of naturally flop open. Your palms should face forward, just like sad, standard anatomical position. And in this position, you don't have to worry about stacking or aligning anything because the ground helps you to do that naturally. So palms up, feet open, eyes closed. The shoulders are not up here by your neck, right? The shoulders are down the back, so you could even lift and relax them down. And a lot of times, if you carry tension or stress, it happens to manifest in this upper area, in the shoulder area. So that would mean the shoulders are sort of curling up like this, and you're like tight and holding on here. Um, if that's the case, just kind of check in, notice what's happening in your shoulder girdle, and if you need to let go and relax. This is oftentimes when a teacher might come around and give you a little push on your shoulders just to help that relaxation process happen. Now for Shavasana, you might be here for five minutes. In a, in a yoga class that's an hour, hour and a half long, hopefully you're getting a five minute Shavasana. If you're getting anything less than that, maybe tell your teacher that they should up it. <laughs> Uh, anything more than that is a bonus, but five minutes is kind of the golden zone for an hour to an hour and a half class. So you could take this at home if you're doing a home practice. If you're in a yoga studio, they will probably guide you through some sort of shavasana. And then when you're ready to come out, you just wiggle your fingers, your toes, roll your wrists and ankles. You could do a little stretch. Just kind of imagine like you just woke up from a really deep sleep and take a few moments to move around. And then when you're ready, I like to hug my knees into my chest and just kind of rock and roll a little side to side and forward and backward, coming up into the final seated position. So again, we went through a lot of postures today, a lot of different standing poses, some seated stuff, um, but the general rule of thumb is start from the ground and work your way up in every single posture. Now in down dog, you have two points of contact. Your hands and your feet are both on the ground. So you start from each and you work your way up to your hips. Right? This is the best way to go about doing any alignment for any posture. So hopefully this is helpful. I know that this was a very fast run through of these poses. So as you're going through this video, if you see a pose and you're working on it, just pause it, work through the alignment, do it on your own. And when you've gotten through all of it, then you can press play and move on to the next. But you have this video, so use it as much as you need. And if you have questions, you can always refer to the discussion board, which I'll get to just as soon as I possibly can. So good luck.